<laughs> Welcome everybody. I'm really glad that you made it and I hope that you'll enjoy this exploration of creativity in the brain. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the talk and we're going to do it in three parts. The first is how does an artist perceive creativity? The second one is Dr. Weinberg will talk about creativity in the brain and how scientists view creativity. And the third part is David Thompson, the gallery director of, um, at Artlery 160, will talk about AI in the brain, uh, an interesting new aspect of how are computers creative and do they want to be creative. <laughs> I thought um, when I was putting together this show and this talk, how do you access creativity? What is creativity? And historically, artists have access, uh, tried to access creativity in a number of ways. <laughs> they try and go into the zone in a kind of unconventional way, uh, or maybe conventional to artists, by using drugs and alcohol is a way to kind of get into that zone and you can create from that way. But when you get out of that zone, you're looking at the work and you're thinking, what did I do? And it's not as efficient as other ways of doing it. I was starting to use different techniques for accessing creativity in the brain. And I began using the techniques of lucid dreaming. That's how I started this whole thing. And I was actually in a couple of shows in Art and the Lucid Dream. I found out I was so surprised there were a number of artists that use Lucid Dream. I thought of another way of accessing creativity and I discovered Qigong. And Qigong is a Chinese technique that um, Kung Fu experts use and also um, Tai Chi people use. And it's the basics of Chinese energy and it's like acupuncture using the meridians. So I began doing creativity this way. And, and it, was, uh, it was an interesting technique. And so then I began thinking, what will I do for my students? How do you translate a three-dimensional world into this flat piece of paper, a flat canvas? How can I translate this more into the students? I wanted them to get the experience of seeing in a different way. I began um, thinking about how when we're kids, when we're three or four years old, children just take those big paintbrushes and go like this and they're very free and they go down the beach and they sit by the water and they build castles and they take their blocks and they make houses and trains and take their dolls they're really creative so what happens to creativity when you get older so I thought I would bring in a couple of student examples I wanted to bring this in because these are students that are very capable in other aspects of their lives and our education system emphasizes verbal skills, analytical reasoning, logic, and doesn't really emphasize creativity. So when I was teaching the students and drawing the zone, I was encouraging them to let go of the idea that there's a right way to do art. And instead, I wanted them to let go and allow the brain to move in a creative, nonlinear state. This is a class at the museum school that I was teaching in the evening. And this is a drawing from Rebecca, who was actually one of my youngest um, museum school students. She's a high schooler. She'd have her mom drive her in the evening after her uh, camp. She was teaching as a counselor camp. And she would come for this uh, six-week class. And these slides are all from students who took one class a week, a one uh, two and a half hour class once a week for five weeks. And this is her first drawing, and then this is her second drawing. And you can see that she's made a really big leap from not seeing to suddenly being able to see around a curve and really have a mastery. And then this student here is actually quite accomplished dental surgeon, and she had um, been getting up at 4.30 in the morning and then coming to class in the evening. She had a very long day to stay to class till 9.30 at night. And then this is her fifth drawing. So you look at these drawings and you're saying, what are these students doing? How are they managing to shift in their brain state? And that was what became the idea for Tasting Paint, Expanding Creativity. How can everybody expand their artistic vision? How can you see around a curve? How can you uh, do that? I was starting to think about what would make brain paths easier. And I started talking to neurobiologists on how that would work. And when I taught in Vietnam, the students didn't speak English. 
So how are they learning? But they learned. And they were so much fun to teach. And they, were, they really got it fast. And some things about the students in Vietnam made it easy because they were more used to meditation because they're mostly Buddhist. And that made quite a difference. I had four guiding questions um, that compelled the development of tasting pain. How does viewing art affect creative thinking? Where are the viewers in the artistic process? Can the invisible become visible? And how does a change in the brain show up in the body? So these are the questions that are the basis for tasting paint. Tonight, we don't have the time to answer it, but I wanted to give you background on what I was thinking and how artists think on a way of shifting your brain state. This show is an exhibition of my paintings coupled with the idea that the viewer always has a role in creativity. So what is that role? You know, viewers go to a show, they take out their phone, they're walking through the show. I wanted them to have a little bit more of a chance to actually feel what creativity felt like in their bodies. So I decided to translate and augment my experiences with sensation in the show. And in Tasting Paint, viewers have the opportunity to notice what creativity feels like in their own body and then to scientifically validate the experience. So there's like biofeedback mechanisms that, that people can use. And it's the non-logical, uh, non-verbal, and I said non-logical because when you're not in the creative state, you don't really know what's happening. And that's why I had mentioned being in an alternative state, because when you're creating, you're in another place. And that's why I showed the students' drawings. Where is that place that suddenly they can go from not understanding what a box looks like to drawing a beautiful, uh, a beautiful drawing of an onion? I mean, how are they moving there? So the senses help you help heighten creativity and help you move from one area of your brain to the other area of the brain. And I find that creativity is an adventure. It's a moving into not knowing, because having an answer cuts off all discovery. So if you know what a cat looks like, you're going to draw the cat the same way every time. But if you're thinking, I wonder what that is, then suddenly a palm will emerge in a funny space. And you have no idea how you get there. But it's something that you've seen in a different way for the first time. So in the exhibit, I want people to have their own sensory exhibit experience. And the goal in Tasting Paint is just to feel, just to see, just to hear, and just to allow yourself to shift from your sympathetic, everyday state into your non-sympathetic, kind of let down relaxation response. That's the whole context of Tasting Paint. This is uh, our sensory carnivals, which are running every Saturday from 1 to 4. Please come and join us. They're actually quite a lot of fun. And you get to play with different sound, different touch, different senses, and just have fun and find out where you are in that sensory realm. And nobody's testing your, um, your answers. Um, you're just kind of doing it for yourself and for movement. And this is the hours for tasting paint. And I have cards up here. And please grab a card if you don't have one already that you can take with you when you go. So thank you.